Church, I, I pray that when we gather together and when we sing, your, your appetite is, is wet for what it's going to be like when we finally receive our promise of him. It's, it's services like this where we got to see baptism, where we get to sing together, where we get to open uh, his word, and it, it just stirs our hearts for affection of, I cannot wait until that day. I can't wait until that day. If I'm honest with you, this has been a, a difficult week. You'll, you'll see up in the choir loft that uh, we lost a very dear brother, a deacon, a choir member. And it's bittersweet because on this end, we, we hurt and we mourn and we long because he had a bright light. He was such an encourager, Amen. Jeff Stewart. And yet we rejoice because we know he's receiving his promise. Yes, yes. He made it faithful until the end. And I long to make it faithful until the end and to see my Lord and Savior face to face. And so when we meet every Sunday, here, here's the deal. It's always about the gospel. No matter what we're talking about, it's always seen through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the perspective that he gives us, even when it's a charging sermon. Right, And this is going to be a charging sermon, but it's always in light of who he is and what he has done. So turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. Okay, a few weeks ago, we're walking through the book of Ephesians, and in chapter 5, we had this pivotal moment uh, in verse 21 where evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that there is this submission that overflows in our life to proper authority that God has placed. There is this submission. And then Paul is going to jump into what, what's called the household code. And he's going to immediately talk about how th this, this submission, this evidence of the Holy Spirit should overflow within the Christian's life, both in the home uh, as, as husband and wife, as parent and child, and then in the workplace. And so last week, we were on wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And we defined that submission is humble recognition of divine order. And then we're going to see how it's carried on to children and to uh, workers. Now, it was funny this week. I, I had a number of comments from wives who, who just reached out to me and said, what a great sermon, but I can't wait for next Sunday. <laughs> Right, a few of you are, are, are a bit too anxious, right? You set your alarm 30 minutes early. You just say, oh, 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 today's the day. You got that elbow ready? It's gonna be an awesome day because God's word is good and it is truthful. So listen, as we read Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25 through 33. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of, the water, of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands, ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, 
And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, we love your word. We cannot even fathom how you have developed and planned an unfolding mystery from eternity past how you knew in creation of man and woman and marriage that you would ultimately be picturing your love for the church. This morning, we pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to be able to hear and understand all that you've done. The magnificent picture of your love from eternity past your sacrificial love for us, your pursuit of us when we were altogether unlovely. And help us within our homes to picture that light, to picture your gospel, to shine that light to our neighbors around us who are struggling and hurting and need to see a picture of your gospel. Father, we confess sometimes how petty we can become and how little we think of our marriages in light of how it pictures the gospel. Help us to that end. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sometimes it's hard for us to conceive that the Greco-Roman world would have laughed at certain Christian ideals, like every person has been made in the image of God with equal dignity and worth. See, because in ancient times, men were viewed superior to women in almost every way. Women were expected to serve and be quiet With almost no education, they had very little say about what would take place in their lives. Most were married off at prepubescent age. Men had prostitutes, concubines, and wives, all for their pleasures and purposes. The ancient pagan man breathed adultery. The marriage bond was virtually meaningless. Women lived in fear that her husband might divorce her for any old reason. In summary, pagan marriage was an absolute shambles. It was into this darkness that the light of Christian truth shone. Jesus' longest recorded conversation in the Gospels is in John 4 with a woman of ill repute. A sinful woman in Luke 7 crashes a dinner party, wiping uh, his feet with her tears and hair. He healed unclean women, allowed women to sit at his feet and learn right there with the disciples. He first appeared, resurrected from the dead to a group of women. And now within Christian marriage, husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loves the church. You see, the brightness of that light stands in cultural contrast. You see, although last week, Wives were told to submit and to honor their husbands as the head. Here, men are not told to lead out of that headship. But rather, there's a dramatic shift. Because the focus immediately becomes on her loveliness. The priceless jewel that has been entrusted to him. She is so valuable. She is worth selfless sacrifice. Die to yourself for her sake. 
to meet her needs, not yours. Nothing like the prideful pagan who dominates his wife with his own selfishness, who is harsh and unbridled with his words. The truth hurts. Deal with it, sweetie. A dominant man who's obsessively in control does not value her opinion nor treat her like an equal partner. You see, a true man, real strength is pictured in the way that Christ laid down his life for his love. You see, love rendered the heavens and was born a helpless babe. Love endured trial and temptation by the devil. Love sweat drops of blood and drank the cup of the wrath of God. Love cried out, it is finished. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You see, true beauty and worth is only displayed whenever there is a cost sacrificed for the object that you are trying to protect. Love involves sacrifice. You see, I can say that I love my wife endlessly, but if I never meet her needs, If I never wash the dishes, if I never provide for her, if I never have meaningful conversation with her, do I really love her? The 19th century philosopher Kierkegaard wrote a parable wanting to express the humble love of Jesus towards us. He writes, suppose there was a king who loved a humble maiden. The king was like no other king. Every statesman trembled before his power. No one dared breathe a word against him, for he had the strength to crush all of his opponents. And yet this mighty king was melted by love for a humble maiden. How could he declare his love for her? You see, in an odd sort of way, his very kingliness tied his hands If he brought her to the palace and crowned her head with jewels and clothed her body in royal robes, she would surely not resist. No one dared resist him. But would she really love him? Sure, she would say that she loved him, of course. But would she truly? Or would she live with fear in him, nursing a private grief for the life that she had left behind? Would she be happy by his side? How could he know? If he rode to her in the forest, to her cottage, in his royal carriage with an armed escort waving bright banners, that too would overwhelm her. He did not want a cringing subject. He wanted a lover, an equal. He wanted her to forget that he was a king and she a humble maiden and to let their shared love cross over the gulf between them. You see, for it is only in love that an unequal can be made equal, concluded Kierkegaard. The king convinced that he could not elevate the maiden without crushing her freedom, resolved to descend. So he clothed himself as a beggar and approached her cottage incognito and wore a cloak fluttering loosely about him. You see, it was no mere disguise, but a new identity that he took on. He renounced the throne to win her hand. You see, what's so beautiful about the parable, the illustration, is Christ's willingness to condescend. The fact that he permanently took on flesh in order to win us. Furthermore, it highlights the absolute beauty that love must be freely given. 
However, in Kierkegaard's illustration, you will notice there is one particular thing where the illustration falls apart. That is that as we imagine the story, we imagine the maiden lovely and secretly worthy of the king's affection. The truth of the matter is, is the Bible tells a different story. The Bible says in Romans 5 that God demonstrates his love towards us in that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies. We were not lovely. We we were not pursuing God, just hoping for a chance. Rather, the Bible tells us that we were running the other way. We were actually fighting against him when Christ died for us. Guys, why is this so important? Well, it's important to your faith for you to understand that if Christ loved you when you were his enemy, how much more so now that you have been reconciled to him? And it's very important in this context as husbands because... Christ did not say, I will love them when. Whenever they show me a little respect. Whenever she loses a little weight. Whenever she gets more organized and gets a job, starts carrying her weight around here. No. Christ pursued you. When you were in absolute rebellion against his kingship. You see, there are two pictures that Paul uses to compel husbands to love their wives. The first one is a picture that is woven all through the Old Testament about how God is a husband to his people and his people are the bride. The Old Testament repeats this imagery that Yahweh is a husband to his people. And Ezekiel chapter 16 is of extreme importance here. Because if you walk through Ezekiel 16, God says that he found Israel, his people, as an infant, abandoned on the side of the road to die. And God came and scooped them up and cared for them. And then as she grew old and as she became of age, God became a husband to her. And he washed her and cleansed her and purified her. And then he anointed her with oil and adorned her with fine jewelry and then put clothes on her that made her fitting of a king. You see, the one who was once an abandoned child left to die is suddenly beautiful, redeemed, and dignified. The New Testament picks up that very imagery and right here in our text says that Jesus is that husband and that the church is that bride. You see, right here he is pictured and he takes the bride and and gives a prenuptial bath. She is sanctified and cleansed by the word of his gospel. And he is the one who is preparing the bride for her final presentation at the very end. That Jesus is constantly tending to and working with the church to prepare her for the very end when the church, when you and I will stand before God Almighty, cleansing in all of our glory, without spot or blemish, but so that you and I would be holy and blameless. He is working tirelessly to present us on that day. Now, a quick aside. You may not know the history of a best man in wedding tradition. 
It actually started in the 1500s in Scotland. Now, in, in most of the time, you would marry a woman from your own village. But in certain dire circumstances, there wouldn't be enough women to go around. And so what you, I guess what they did is they went to a nearby village and kidnapped a bride and brought her back. Now, needless to say, this could be risky business to go and to pillage another village and to snag a woman and bring her back. And so the best man was your most loyal, best fighter. And he would go with you and he would help you abduct her and bring her back. And then you would immediately try and enter into a marriage ceremony. And the best man would stand at the right hand of the groom with his hand on the sword, only waiting for her family to come. And he would have to protect and fight them off. How's that for a tradition? In complete contrast, Christ does not abduct or force. Rather, he's cleansing, preparing, nurturing, removing every spot or blemish, preparing her to present her to himself. Husbands, does your love cleanse and purify your wife? Is she more like Christ because she's married to you? There is coming a day very soon when you and her will stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and you will present her. Will you hear, well done. You served her, you prayed for her, you patiently watered as the Lord grew her. You treated her as precious. You were understanding and patient and you developed the beauty of her soul. Don't you see how petty and selfish always trying to be right is in light of this context? You say the weight of that is too heavy, pastor. Young men, can I share with you when I look back on my life, when I genuinely pass from being a boy to a man, Coming out of high school, I was dependent upon having a girlfriend. If, if one girl and I didn't work out, I, I immediately began to cling to any life raft that came along. There, there was this desperate hole in me that I was clinging on to any girl. You would, you would say that I was finding my identity or my worth in another person. And undoubtedly, that proves to be suffocating, unbearable for any young lady. And then God in his kindness began to speak to my heart and began to show me that any time my identity is in any other thing, it fails whether it's in another person, whether it's in the things that I'm good at, whether it's in stuff, in items, they all fall except for him, except for him. And in his kindness, his Holy Spirit walked me through this process where I realized that every other thing falls in if I put my identity and my trust in him, suddenly, this strength rose up inside of me 
that he was my identity, that he was my trust. And there was this strength that began to overflow and allow me to serve and to love other people. Until you understand that as a Christian husband, you are fighting a losing battle. The second picture that Paul paints throughout this text, that is to compel you as a husband to love your wife, is he says, you should love your wife because you are one body. Because you are one body. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And then he goes on to quote Genesis 2, uh, 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. For a man to truly love his wife, he must care about her physically, emotionally, and spiritually. He must care for her as he does himself and strive to meet her needs. Now, I need you to stop and I need you to think about this for a second because if you pause, you'll realize that there are tough parts of the body and then there are tender parts of the body. You may not know this. Uh, I didn't realize it until I started shaving my head that the the actual top of your head is, is pretty rough, okay? When I shave, I have very little feeling up here. Uh, that's why I get sunburned real easy because you just don't feel it. But when I go to shave my head, you just, you know, go to town, whack it off. But my neck is a completely different story. All right, when I go to shave my neck, I only go with the grain. Any of you guys with me? This neck is a very tender spot. I only shave about once every three days because this neck is so sensitive. Well, when I was in college, I was in India, and a group of guys there began to talk about, how we have to try this incredible experience about going to a barber and getting a shave. Go to a barber and get a shave. And, and you're like, yeah, what could be a more manly thing to do? Let's go to the barber and get a shave. Now, you pause and you think about that for a second. Like, what is the most vulnerable position that I could ever get in front of a stranger? <laughs> well, needless to say, I don't speak any Hindi, and he didn't speak any English. But I can tell you, in the middle of that shave, at no point have I ever uh, prayed to speak in tongues than right there at that moment to say, please go with the grain, go with the grain. It's one of the most painful experiences of my life. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to her as the weaker vessel. That means that she is precious, that she is more delicate, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Tenderly caring for her as a priceless jewel that you have been tasked to protect. God has given you a helpmate Someone who is different than you, uh, thinks different than you, has different life experiences, has different strengths. If you do not listen to her, you're a fool. Can a man ignore his hand burning on a hot stove? The two most common types of dysfunctional husbands are the dominant controlling ones who don't treat her tenderly or special. We've been highlighting that. But secondly, is the passive husband who is just like his father, Adam, who stood idly by while the serpent 
tempted his wife. And when the time came to give account, he was simply filled with excuses. That sounds like far too many husbands that I know. You see, there is nothing passive about the way that Christ loved the church. Not only did he pursue her when we were lost, he intercedes for us, protects us, provides for us. And not only that, he knows us. He knows us. Think of what it takes to know someone, to genuinely know them. Scripture says his thoughts towards us outnumber the sand on the shore. Husbands, do you know your wives? I'm talking about right now. I'm not talking about 20 years ago. I'm talking about do you know her? Do you know what the Lord is teaching her? Do you know her needs? Do you pray with her? Outside of Christ, she should be your number one priority. Do you pursue her? There is nothing passive about the picture that Christ will one day present the church to himself. Think about how much he loves the church. Christ has drawn near to her in a sacrificial way. And his closeness allows him to address issues, removing every spot or wrinkle. Go with me in your mind's eye to the first three chapters in the book of Revelation, where Jesus is dressed as a priest who is walking amongst the lampstands. And the lampstands are each of the individual churches. And there as priest, he is constantly tending to the lampstands, trimming the wicks, making sure it's lit. And then as he walks through and deals with every church, what does he say? He says, I know you. I know this is what's going on in your, your life. I know you. I know this. And then he also says, but I have this against you. You see, Jesus' closeness, the fact that he draws near, means not only does he sacrifice himself, lay down his life in love, but his closeness allows him to address and take responsibility for every issue in the church. You see, closeness of relationship allows to deal with issues. And the same is called for us as husbands, as spiritual leaders. You see, any rebuke from afar is harsh. It's the way it works. But if you draw near, as Jesus draws near, not passively, idly by, ignoring. There is a closeness in relationship that works both ways, but, but the priority is given to the husband, a closeness in relationship where there is a cleansing one to another. Why? Because one day you are going to present her. Is she more holy because of your loving correction. Kim and Cricket Carpenter are the real life couple behind the 2012 Hollywood hit movie titled The Vow. In 1993, Kim and Cricket happily wed only to get in a terrible car accident two months later. Cricket suffered a life-threatening brain injury and one of the side effects was that she forgot everything about her new husband. No memory of their entire relationship. She didn't even recognize him. Pause for a moment and think about this. No 
honeymoon bliss. And for those of you that have ever done the difficult work of caring for someone in the midst of failing health, imagine the stress and strain. Truthfully, it would have been easy to simply walk away. In fact, several of his friends counseled him to, but he didn't. Until death do us part in sickness and in health. Instead, he chose to love her and to set out to make her fall in love with him all over again. And ultimately, that led to them two years later renewing their vows in a second ceremony. You see, He was preparing her for himself. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, all across this room, I know that Husbands are challenged and charged. As a husband, undoubtedly, I hit my knees before you and I cry out for more strength, for more of your strength, for more of your love. Jesus, you have to pour in me so that I can pour out to all that you have made me responsible for. And I confess I am a weak, empty vessel, but I need you. And we need you. Jesus, may this also be the flavor of our church. Not only as husbands, but all of us. That you fill us so that we overflow to all that you have tasked us with. Jesus, if left to ourself, we are empty. And so we hold on to your promises. We cry out for your promises. We cry out for more of you, more of your strength. We want to picture your gospel. We want to walk worthy of you. Help us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.